Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Bob Damon. I'm the dean of the Tepper School. I want to welcome everyone that's here today, especially all of our MBA graduating students, their family and friends and significant others that are with us today. Uh, I'd also like to extend a, a special welcome to uh, the president of Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Jerry Kuhn, who uh, I'm sure is very busy this time of the year with graduation and commencement for the university as a whole. Uh, as many of you know, Jerry is uh, going to be stepping down as the president of Carnegie Mellon uh, at the end of June of this year. Jerry has done a remarkable job for the university as a whole. He's been a very strong supporter of the Tepper School of Business. And I want to thank him for everything he's done for us and for the, for the university and welcome him as well here today. Jerry, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, congratulate the class of 2013 uh, this afternoon. So this is a great event to kick off uh, what, what is uh, sure to be a remarkable weekend for you all, and, and we're all very excited about, uh, about the graduation and the commencement, but also uh, uh, the entire weekend starting with this event. Um, we're very pleased that you're able to join us here today uh, for a special opp opportunity to hear from and interact with one of the uh, most accomplished international businessmen of our time. Uh, and we're very pleased to be hosting such an impressive guest on the eve of your graduation. And I'm sure this is gonna be very memorable for, for all of you. Uh, but before I introduce our special guest, I want to just give you a little bit of background on the format for today. Um, we had asked the graduating class to submit questions for our uh, special guest, Mr. Tata. And in working with the Graduate Business Association, the GBA, we uh, pared that list down to a set of questions that we will be asking uh, Mr. Tata uh, today. And I want to thank all of you who did submit qu uh, questions for today's forum. Um, Mr. Tata today is going to be discussing uh, topics that range from his leadership style to his legacy and I think it's going to be a terrific collection of topics and insights that uh, we will uh, d delve into. Uh, Varun Kumar sitting to my far right uh, is a graduating MBA student is also the outgoing president of the Graduate Business Association. He's going to be uh, moderating the Q&A uh, to keep us on track today. Uh, Varun is going to be starting his career at Groupon in uh, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, where I think he interned as well this summer. And uh, I want to thank uh, Varun uh, and also the rest of the GBA for all of the help they have given me as the dean and the administration of the school uh, on a number of fronts and being a, an important source of information and advice for us over the last uh, year. So thank you and congratulations on a great job, Varun. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our special guest. Uh, the program that you have received uh, has highlights of as many of accomplishments in the profile of the Tata companies. Uh, but I would like to take a moment just to highlight some of this for you. Uh, Mr. Ratan Tata is Chairman Emeritus of the Tata Group, as well as Chairman Emeritus of several of the t major Tata companies, including Tata Steel, Tata Motors, Tata Power, Tata Consultancy, Tata Chemicals, and the Indian Hotels Company. The Tata Group companies are known around the world with more than 450,000 employees and revenues that exceed $100 billion. The company and, of course, its leadership have uh, generated global attention for the company's innovative business strategies 
emphasis on ethics and customer service, as well as community, uh, commitment to community, all of which we'll be touching on uh, in today's uh, forum. His leadership and involvement is, uh, is not limited by geography. He has served on business and advisory councils in the UK and in Singapore, and serves on the board of directors and committees of a number of publicly held companies, including Alcoa, Fiat, Mitsubishi, Rolls-Royce Group, and several others. Mr. Tata holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell University and completed the Advanced Management Program at Harvard Business School. He's received honorary doctorates from universities around the world, and I'm also pleased to, that on, on this Sunday at our commencement, he will be receiving a, a, an honorary doctorate of business practice from Carnegie Mellon University. The list of awards and accomplishments of Mr. Tata go on and on. I could spend our entire time talking about them, but I, I think we should move on. I'll leave it to you to look at the program uh, that gives you a good uh, set of highlights of his career. So now please join me in welcoming and expressing appreciation and enthusiasm for Mr. Ratan Tata. Uh, as the dean of the school, I appointed myself to ask the first question. So <laughs> I have that privilege. Um, as, as you all know, the Tata Group owns the wonderful uh, Taj Hotels in, in, uh, in Mumbai, uh, which I had a privilege of staying at on my recent trip to, uh, to India. Um, my question is that uh, relates to the 2008 uh, Mumbai terror attack on the Taj Hotel uh, and the response of the employees of the, of the hotel. Um, the Taj employees and managers were actually very remarkable in, in terms of how they dealt with that, um, with that situation. And um, it speaks very highly of their bravery, their dedication, and their courage. These employees uh, put the safety of the hotel guests and the Tata values above their own personal interests. Uh, and my question is, uh, what is it that do you attribute um, this unique Tata culture to? Um, I don't know in fairness whether it would be right to talk of a Tata culture. Here was a situation that no one ever anticipated, no one ever planned for, wasn't covered in any training that the employees got, um, and yet we had real evidence of, of heroics and, and sacrifice, in some cases, um, sacrifice of one's life. Um, it's not clear what, what took place, but it was mobilizing a, a line of action that saved virtually all all the residents of the hotel, there were about 300 there at that time. The, the board of Unilevers was having dinner there. And the staff basically closed off and turned off the lights and uh, got everybody to lie on the floor and be quiet and moved everybody out through the kitchen and saved many lives, they, and we unfortunately lost about 37 of our own staff. So it's very difficult to, to determine what took place, or why, that, why they acted in the manner they did, but it, it was quite exemplary and, and uh, made us very proud. I think they were the heroes of, of those three days, not the, not the police, not the army, Perhaps the commandos did what they had to do, but they, the staff really stood by the guests as, as one expected that they would, but far, far beyond what, they, what anybody had expected. I don't have a, a reason to attribute to this other than just devotion to the guests. Thank you. Merwin? Yep. 
So sir, uh, you took over as the chairman of the Tata Group in 1991, and that was also the time when the Indian economy was uh, you know, going through liberalization. And you took it one step forward, you took the Tata Group uh, and gave it a global identity. Uh, you know, you went ahead and did various acquisitions like uh, Jaguar and Land Rover, uh, Tetley Group, the Chorus. What was your philosophy behind going global? Um, basically, I, I felt that in many ways, India would take some time to, to allow growth. Uh, it was opening up. We were trying our best to grow in India. And there were many roadblocks in, uh, attitudinal roadblocks as we opened up. Also, during that same time, uh, there were opportunities abroad that we, that we saw that filled a gap that we had in a product mix or a technology or, or a particular geography, and, and we decided that we would avail of it. Um, Part of it ended up being uh, bolstered by a feeling that the empire is striking back and uh, we're paying back for all the years of colonialism that we, <laughs> that we had, but that wasn't the real reason. And, and uh, so it was a gamble that we could manage companies six or 8,000 miles away, but we, we did take that plunge. Uh, for my next question, um, the Tata Group also has a very strong presence in multiple sectors such as Tata Steel, you've automobiles, information technology. What are the key aspects as the chairman of such a huge uh, you know, brand of products and companies that you see, okay, what are your focus areas going to be on? While, while, the, while being the chairman? Or? Yes. You know, the, what I, we, we have about 80 companies and about 40 businesses, so it's one of the early tasks I undertook or statements I made was that we would re, restructure the group, which we never really did. We re regrouped them, but they remained the same. I, I took over a closer oversight of the nine largest companies. Mm -hmm and assign the oversight of, of the rest to different people. Um, I think one of the reasons that we have been able to hold ourselves together has been the fact that each of our companies has been reasonably autonomous, have their own boards, have their own shareholders, and so they operate as a as a conglomerate or as a commonwealth rather of companies, uh, each one looking after their own thing. And the, the job of the chairman is to ensure that they all belong to the same group, that they have the same DNA as they, as they move forward. Thank you. Uh, for the next question, we have uh, one of our students, um, Jorge Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Tata. Uh, the next question we have for you is, as you look back at the start of your professional career, after you graduated from Cornell and joined the Tata Group on the shop floor, what advice do you have for our graduating class as we start or resume our professional careers as MBAs? <laughs> That's a pretty um, tall order for me to try to advise <laughs> what all of you would do. Um, all I can say is that you probably, like, like me, feel that your parents have made the wisest and the most valuable decision in putting you through a good educational program because that's the foundation that you will have as you move out. And you will be lost in the, in the real world initially or have a feeling of being lost because it's very different from what you think it is going to be. I would say that, speaking for myself, if, if you did what you would feel happiest doing in terms of the kind of job that you have or the kind of an 
enterprise that you are working for, you probably will do well, and if you are unhappy with the environment in which you are, you probably will always be looking over your shoulder. So go into a business not for money, but for the enjoyment or the satisfaction of what you do, and uh, hopefully address that job with a sense of ethics and values, and I would imagine that will put each of you in as good a position as I could imagine. I can't say anything more. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Carla. Thanks again for spending the time with us, Mr. Tar. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask you is that um, your companies have always maintained a very high health ethical standard, despite having uh, been born and grown in, in India, which is a country that has been known for Sorry, um, experiencing. Can you hear the question, probably? Can, can you repeat it? Oh, um, your your companies have always maintained a very high uh, ethical standards, despite the fact that they started and have grown in, in India, which has uh, a, a known problem with uh, corruption. We were wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what was the price that you had to pay for it as you were trying to expand your business, and um, why do you feel this was worth it? Price we paid to... Um, so what, what she's asking is that the Tata's group are known for being ethical, okay, and okay. India is known for corruption, right. so... <laughs> <laughs> he, says, he said it more directly than... than you did. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, I think we paid, we did pay a price from time to time where we lost out on an opportunity that we, that we had. But if you look at what we did, in 91 we were a $5 billion group, and in 2012 we were a $100 billion group. So we didn't, despite all of that, we didn't do too badly in terms of how we grew. But there have been instances uh, where we could have been in one area, could have grown in a particular area which we have been deprived of doing. So there, have, there has been a cost. Um, there has been from time to time a sense of frustration. Incidentally, that is part of the reason why we started to look outside because it was somewhat easier to, to grow or to fulfill your ambitions rather than uh, fight the tide within India. Thank you. Can I follow up just yeah. a bit on that? Uh, from an educational perspective, ethics is one of the most challenging subject areas to, to actually uh, teach. Um, the Tepper School uh, has uh, had an ethics course in its curriculum since the mid-1970s. We were one of the first business schools to introduce ethics into the curriculum. We, we really believe it's, it's important, uh, even though it presents challenges for teaching individuals who are 27, 28 years old who have already formed their moral compass in life. Um, the best we can hope to do is just make them aware of the moral challenges that they're going to face when they leave uh, the business school and, and head into the real world. Um, but one of, the, one of the things we try to emphasize with them is that as leaders, as business leaders, that uh, their effectiveness is going to depend uh, directly on their morals and how ethical they, they are. Um, so I'd like to ask a question, maybe a follow-up on a couple of things that have already come up, which is um, when you grow through acquisition and you're acquiring companies and people from other organizations, uh, it can sometimes be challenging to bring the culture of the Tata group to the, to the acquired company, but also bring the sense of, of moral obligation and ethics to the people you're acquiring. Um, how have you dealt with that through your acquisitions? It's, it's a very good question. Most people don't know that we, when we look at an acquisition prior to actually 
going through that acquisition, we spend a lot of time and energy in determining whether the culture of that organization is compatible with ours. We have walked away without anybody knowing that we were looking at a particular company. We have walked away from companies that would have been a good fit, but where the culture would have been alien to our own. And by culture, I don't mean the culture of the rank and file, I mean the culture of the management. And if we, particularly in overseas acquisitions, if we felt that there was a different culture, uh, you know, there, there are many companies that operate in the manner that they think is fine, but it's, in our view, unethical or a value system that we don't subscribe to, then we have quietly walked away from that company and never acquired it, although the fit would have been a good business fit. And the reason we did that is exactly what you implied. How could we change the culture of that activity without sweep, sweeping the management clean and inserting who? Our own management in a foreign geography. We don't have the depth to do that. Um, so it's after we make this determination that we have actually gone and acquired the company and, and it has worked reasonably well because we have then, by cross-fertilization, changed people, moved people back and forth. And uh, we haven't had a real problem with the acquisitions we've had. We've had to change it time to time a key manager because there's been a problem. Not an ethical problem, but just an operational problem. Uh, and it's worked reasonably well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Travis Campbell. Good afternoon, Mr. Tata, and thank you for your time and perspective today. So staying on the topic of acquisitions, I wanted to ask you about a specific one. So looking back now, we see that the Jaguar Land Rover acquisition has been a success. I was curious, to, what was the specific synergies that attracted you to them in the first place, and what were the keys to their turnaround? Well, what, Do you want to repeat it? <laughs> There's a lot of boom in... Sorry, it, it's specifically asking about the Jaguar Land Rover acquisition. So yeah. what attracted you to them in the first place, and then what were the keys uh, to the turnaround? Okay. Thank you. Um, the truth is that what attracted me initially was the fact that Land Rover was for sale, and that sat nicely over the product mix that we had in India in the SUV area. But Ford refused to separate Jaguar from Land Rover. I didn't see what we could do with Jaguar at that time. Uh, <laughs> it it uh, was... Uh, something that we negotiated and moved back and forth for over a year before we realized that they were never going to be, you know, cut apart and would always be together. And we later found out why, because they were so intertwined in manufacturing facilities that it would have been impossible to sell one without having uh, manufacturing ties with the other. Um, having taken Jaguar by, by circumstance, we were pleasantly surprised to see that it was a company that had embedded in it enormous capability and talent, which Ford and in the previous managements to Ford had never allowed the management to, to really express itself in terms of new product, in terms of direction, et cetera. And all we did was allow or make a statement to the management and the workers that they could make their own destiny. We were there to support them or, or, to, or to guide them, but we would not dictate to them what they should do. And together they have, in fact, fulfilled that objective quite quite admirably uh, as things stand. The sales are up 40 odd percent from what they were when we took them over. And uh, we're, we're very proud of what they've been able to do. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next up, we have Kristen Putman. Hello, Mr. And thank you for coming to speak with us today. We had in our curriculum the case study of the Tata Nano, which was your pet project. What are the successes and main lessons learned, and what is the future of the Nano? I think um, this is, uh, if you've studied the case, there's been a real mixture of good and bad that has happened, more or less anything that could be a problem has taken place in, in this product. I'd say the success has been that we were able to develop a car at the kind of price line that we set ourselves and that we were able to, to put into the market a car that did everything we promised it would. What we also learned was uh, that we should, uh, part of it was unfortunate, we never, could never have visualized that we would have one lady politician who could bring the whole factory to a halt, <laughs> uh, speaks for the power of the female uh, <laughs> entity. That, uh, and we never, we never, be, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't believe the kind of opposition we had from this one person. We had dead bodies thrown on the site. We had shootings. We had uh, women who came and broke walls, stole material. Most of what happened were she mobilized the women in the in the area. Um, we marketed the, the lessons we've learned is that we marketed the car wrongly. We, we just put it out as, an, as a standard car. We needed to fulfill what we had set out to do, namely that we gave affordable transport to families who rode on two wheelers out in the open. Uh, we marketed as the cheapest car because the marketing people thought that would be its greatest attribute and turned out to be its greatest negative. People didn't want to be seen in the cheapest car. And we, <laughs> no, it's true. And we could not have recognized that we were putting out something that would become a negative. And it should have been that we were putting out a car with the best value for money so we did several things that were wrong, but the lessons we learned is that the one year we lost from the time we decided to move out to West Bengal to the time we established a new facility was also a period of time where the considerable interest was lost in the hype that we had created at the time of the launch sort of dissipated. And we didn't do enough to recreate that when we relaunched the product from its new location. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Cornelia Berger. Hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, as you know, the American auto industry has rebounded in the recent past. What can the Tata Group learn from the American auto industry? From the US industry? Yeah. Um, I don't know that we have learned very much. I've, I've been somewhat personally involved with what's happened in the U.S. because I've been a, a board member of Fiat, which undertook to take over Chrysler. And so I've, I've seen what, what has been happening there. Um, I think the, the U.S., like like the rest of the Western world, saw a downturn in the car industry as a great barometer of the economic situation. And, and what the market needs at that time is, is the excitement of new, new products. And most car companies, quite understandably, cut back on that 
which makes uh, it a sort of dud industry at that time. I'm staying away from the issue of forced bankruptcy and the other steps that were taken. And uh, when companies went through this and, and restructured themselves, they put out, each one of them took steps to reintroduce products in the market in, in greater force than they had done before. And I think that has a lot to do with the excitement that the market is has created. Not to speak of cutting costs and all the other things that, that happened, but they by themselves would not have created the excitement of uh, a resurrection of, of the car industry as it, as it has been. I think that's a lesson that also happened in Jaguar Land Rover when we accelerated the new products, we found the market for them was there. It, not having them may have saved costs, but certainly didn't do anything to increase sales. Next up, we have Alankar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tata, for sharing your insights with us. Uh, my question is that in emerging markets such as India, what would be your uh, advice to businesses looking to expand to uh, these markets? Would be, what would be my advice to what? Uh, for the businesses that are looking to expand into emerging markets such as India. Expand in new markets? Such as India. Such as India? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let, let me just say that whatever we may be going through at the present moment, which is somewhat disappointing compared to the growth rate we've had in the past seven, eight years, India is a country with enormous opportunity, untapped to a great extent. Um, a billion plus people, a, a young population, 40% under the age of 25, um, a uh, enormous uh, natural resource capability. So the opportunities that are there are quite phenomenal. What we really need is a set of government policies that really allow this to be, to be uh, fulfilled and an attraction to to investment from outside because we one of the greatest shortfalls India has is the lack of infrastructure and I don't believe that we can fund that infrastructure development ourselves so we need to have investment from outside and either we have uh, a hangover from again, colonial days that we don't want our industry to be owned by external uh, entities, or we have chosen to make it very difficult for that to happen. But if we were to ease up on that view, I think the opportunity in India, in the infrastructure, in industrial growth, in products, would be, would be quite enormous. The, uh, the demand is there, the cons consumers are there, the products aren't there today. Thank you, sir. Uh, next we've got Vishal Rana. Thank you, Mr. Tara, for being with us today. My question is, uh, running conglomerates is a unique challenge. Street and investors do not running conglomerates. How did Tata achieve such a stellar success at managing such a big conglomerate? How Tata is? I'll repeat. How did Tata achieve such a stellar success at managing such a big conglomerate? So what he's asking is that the Tata group, you know, it's, it's such a huge conglomerate. And generally, the street does not advise, uh, you know, conglomerates as being successful. However, you have managed that. You know, I think, um Conglomerates went out of fashion in the U.S. in the 70s uh, and got 
broken up into different entities and don't exist in the manner that they did before. But conglomerates continue to exist in Japan, in Korea, in India, and by virtue of the fact that each one is run, as I tried to explain, we, that we have done them, uh, reasonably autonomous, reasonably independent, but within the framework of um, a holding company, which, which we and others have had. Um, in today, in a manner of speaking, even a company like GE is in, in diverse businesses, wholly owned. Ours is not wholly owned. We have, we're just a major shareholder in, in companies. So each company runs fairly much like a standalone company, but has a parent company to which it, to which it turns in its particular sector. So it's a little different from the traditional conglomerate that the U.S. has been used to. But it's quite sustainable in, in my view, and uh, it's only the, I know I'm going to step on or say something out of line, but it's only the, the financial sector that wants you to unlock value constantly, that is trying to entice uh, managers to break up their companies so that they can, they can have value, but they can exist in this manner, and can can grow. Thank you. Can I just follow up yeah. uh, with a question on okay. that? <laughs> <laughs> I told you there'd be a reaction. <laughs> um, so what, what, could you give us sort of the one or two biggest advantages and disadvantages of this conglomerate structure from your perspective? Yeah. Um, some of the advantages of, are, of course, that you in, in our case, for example, we, we do not consolidate the group. There is no consolidation of our finances. There is no Tata Sons or Tata Group. That's a disadvantage because the hundred billion I talked about is, is an aggregation of our revenues and not a stated figure. The, uh, the advantages are that you have a a sum of money at, at the parent company that you can move to different companies as you as you need them, and um, so you bob back and forth from being uh, a seeming a virtual monolith to a a group of loosely loosely held companies, back and forth as the case might be. We we've, we've seen. We've seen no major disadvantage in, in the model that we've had as against disparate individual companies. So you've described the advantages mostly financial. Is, are there operational synergies as well between the groups that, that create these advantages? I believe there could be, but we have not exploited those fully. And perhaps there's been a good reason for that. My predecessor, uh, claimed that each company had to operate competitively and that a company that produced air conditioners would not find a, a fixed market for their product within the Tata Group or that um, companies would not be forced to buy Tata vehicles. So uh, at various times that has worked against us, competitors or uh, prospective customers have said, but you're not selling this within your group, so why are you trying to sell it to me? Uh, on, at the same time, I think it's it set a tone in the, in the group where nothing has been taken for granted, and each of our companies have had to to compete with the competition in the marketplace. For someone like me who has been over the years involved in smaller companies, the worst customers and the most difficult customers I could ever have would be another Tata company. <laughs> so uh, 
I've, I've, seen, I've seen the pluses and minuses of that, but we have not mandated the use of our products uh, automatically. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Som Sridhar. Uh, thank you, Mr. My question, we're being exposed to varying leadership styles. How would you describe your leadership style? Would you describe Sorry. my business style? Your leadership, leadership style. style. You know, I, I don't know that I would be the best person to answer that question. <laughs> and, uh, all I have tried to do is to, when I inherited the chairmanship, uh, I found we were, we were a group of companies pulling in different directions. We had four or five companies in a particular area competing with each other. One is not being mandated to sell within the, thing, within the group. The other is where you have companies in similar businesses competing with each other. and. Uh, all I tried to do is to put them together and, and uh, in fact, remove that kind of unhealthy competition. I'll give you one example of how, how crazy the situation was. Tata started 150 years in textiles. And we had four textile mills. At one time, we were the major textile manufacturers in the country. We were also the first people in textiles. About the time I took over, we had four textile mills. They forgot that there was a market outside, and they competed with each other. They did a terrific job of killing each other in the process. Today, we're not in textiles at all, but we didn't close it down. Each of the mills closed the other one down by, by cutthroat competition, copying their patterns. And uh, I came into the chairmanship just after, just with the aura of this closure, which had just happened. And I realized that, that we needed to do something that was tighter, and we had, therefore, to take away some of the autonomy that there was and create a, a basis where companies couldn't just go into whichever business they wished to. So part of what I've, I think I undertook to do was to bring some box kind of order into the lives of some of these companies, which was resented at first, but it's, it's something that they have lived with since then. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Jeremy Nolan. Hi, my question is uh, going back to the uh, Tata Nano, and um, I'm just wondering how it was for you as the chairman working with young project managers doing the product development and the prototyping of, of, that, of that new uh, breakthrough kind of product? How do I think the... Uh, How is it for you working with young project uh, managers okay. in the prototyping? It, to, to say the least, uh, the development of the project was, was a tremendous challenge. Uh, we had one project team which we had to disband and create another one because the first one, I think, deep down inside, thought the chairman was mad <laughs> and, uh, and didn't really believe that what we set out to do could be done. Uh, the second group decided to hold in abeyance the madness part, but they succeeded in, in putting together what we set out to do. I worked closely with, with the team. Uh, they, needed, they needed support and they needed encouragement when things looked, looked tough. And um, it was for me a, a tremendously rewarding experience as we saw this thing come, come forward. At the time of the launch, I think we evoked 
so much attention that we had no idea that we would ever, that was not our intention at all. So we really, we really had something that was a pleasure to, to work with over that period of time, things that you never thought possible. And we have never done enough to, to leverage what we achieved in this throughout other projects. So uh, for me, it was very rewarding. It's also equally frustrating for me to see that we have not leveraged what we could have in, in terms of taking what we have achieved to another level. Great, thank you. Next up is uh, Rajshree. Thank you, Mr. Tata, for taking the time and sharing your thoughts. My question is regarding the income disparity in the Indian market. So India is a market with huge income disparities. And I wanted to know what's your secret or your strategy when you're running your business successfully in such a socially and economically diverse uh, society where you're serving both the bottom and top of the social py pyramid? You're talking of the, the mixing of the social and the and the business environment uh, together? I just meant more from a strategy perspective. A good example would be uh, the Tata Nano that you had to address the common man who wanted, had the dream to own a car, but then you have the top end of the pyramid where, with the Land Rover. So how do you, how do you go into so socially diverse markets and uh, address those markets? I think, the, I think the Land Rover example is not truly applicable in, because we hardly sell in proportion very much in India. And that has to be viewed as its market in the Western world or in China, as the case might be, which has emerged as its largest market. Uh, but I, I believe that what we, what we have not done enough of is to adequately recognize the, the true w depth of the of the market size at the base of the pyramid. We produce, traditionally, India produces products that cater to the top of the pyramid. And industry is by and large driven by the, the mantra that we do whatever the market can bear. We price whatever the market can bear. It's always trying to achieve the highest margins, etc. And you are restricting yourself to a fairly small part of the potential market. So our consuming market in India is about 200, 250 million people, which is nothing to scoff at. But the base of the pyramid, if you address that, that segment of the market, could increase your market to about 500 to 600 million people. And industry is not ignoring that, that segment of the market. And you have to address that market with new products that, are, that can be affordable to, to that segment of the population. And uh, also, also products that, that serve the kind of environment that the, the base of the pyramid operate in. So I don't think we've done enough on that. We've been trying to address that. We've been trying to create an awareness. But it's, it's a potential that is open to anybody to, to avail of as, as we move forward. Great. Thank you. Next up, we've got Tom Arnett. Mr. Tata, thank you for being here with us today. Um, the question I'd like to ask is, what is the key legacy that you feel that you leave for the Tata Group? Here again, I don't think I should be the one answering that, but <laughs> let me just say that what I hope I've left behind uh, is, is a legacy of doing the right thing and being fair and just to all our stakeholders. We've, we've tried to run our business in in a manner which we have not exploited the market, we have not exploited the customer, and we've, as, as we've said earlier, 
tried to run the, the group with values and ethics rather than exploitation. We could have grown bigger, we could have done more, but we would have compromised our, our uh, standards. I've often, and in fact very early in, in my chairmanship, a young, oddly enough a business graduate came to me, one of our brightest young persons, and said, why are you doing this? You're destroying the group. You're destroying its options. And all I could think of on the spur of the moment was to tell him, I, you know, I just want to go home at night and hold my head high and say I didn't succumb. And that hopefully is a legacy I would say that I hope I've left behind. Thank you. Can I ask one other yeah. question before you ask your last question, <laughs> uh, which has to do with education. Yeah. Uh, I'm in the business of education. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about uh, the importance of education for a country in terms of its growth and prosperity, but also the state of education uh, in the developing world and maybe specifically India. You know, I think that as, as we have young, edu young uh, population, as I mentioned, and we have communications as, as we now have television and telephony that connects us, the young population is desirous and hungry for education, hungry for knowledge, and hungry for a means of getting a livelihood which is not working in the fields or being a shopkeeper but doing something more uh, sub substantive. And there's a tremendous uh, desire for education and knowledge which has to be, has to be tapped. Unfortunately, the institu educational institutions in India are inadequate to cope with the scale of interest and are often beyond the reach of people. We have to find a means of doing the same thing with education as I've tried to say we're trying to do with, uh, with products to make it affordable and reachable to these people in a manner that maybe part of it is knowledge and not a formal education, part of it is just increasing the scale of education that can be, that can be imparted. We have a couple of uh, perhaps dangerous things happening in India, which is reservation of, of uh, educational seats in, in uh, in institutions to the underprivileged class. While this in theory is very good, it's also making it very difficult for the uh, meritorious young, young people to get admission. So there's a need to increase the scale and the magnitude of education that's available in the country. And I think institutions like Carnegie Mellon and others, plus uh, technical institutes, have an opportunity to provide uh, well-conceived but tailored uh, uh, curricula for the Indian students to avail of. I, I think there's a tremendous potential and a tremendous uh, desire to have that knowledge in India. Thank you. All right, sir. So one last question on a totally different topic. Uh, so Jack Welch is taken to book writing. Uh, <laughs> Bill and Melinda Gates are immersed in philanthropy. What are your plans post-retirement? <laughs> I think it's very early to. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, it's just been five months since uh, I, I departed from my office and I'm trying very hard to disentangle myself cleanly. I've so far not even been able to do that. <laughs> uh, 
I, I have been focusing on, on the philanthropic trusts of uh, the foundations that we have in the areas of nutrition and education happens to be one of them, but in the primary education, which is the foundation for, for, what, uh, for what we need, and uh, drinking water. So that's what I'm researching just now in terms of what is the magnitude of the problem and who has done what in this area. But what I'd like to do is to hopefully make a difference in, in what I'm able to do now for the, uh, the vast people of India who have inadequate resources. And I, I hope I can make that difference and can succeed in making that happen. I'm not a good writer, and so uh, I think writing a book is is certainly not on my horizon. Yeah. Well, uh, with that, I want to just uh, thank um, Mr. Rotan for sharing the afternoon with us. Um, this has been an event that I think all of our graduating students will remember uh, as part of their uh, education here at the Tepper School. Uh, so I, again, I want to thank you very much for being so open with us and sharing your time with us. Uh, Thank you very, very much. Please join me in thanking Mr. Rathan Papa. Thank you. Um, may, may I just add that it's been a very enjoyable afternoon for me. Um, I was scared out of my mind to have to sit here this afternoon. And may I join the Dean in wishing those of you graduating all the very best and congratulations for having completed the, the business course and best of luck to you as you move into the real world. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the uh, Tepper School students and faculty and administration, we have a small token of appreciation for you. I think you have it there. Yes. Now, one last thing. Thank you. There's something in the bag, too. Yeah, there's a shirt in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> We have one last request. Um, we would like all of our graduating class, MBA class, to come forward to the stage. We would like to take a group photograph with Mr. Ratan Tata. And so let's show him how much we know about optimization and <laughs> do this quickly. Thank you very much.